Kathy, what a great pleasure to have this special time with you. I've Thank known you, you for 20 years, and we truly are kindred spirits. I met you for the first time in 2001, shortly after you joined Alliance Bernstein to develop their thematic investment business. Since I've been a thematic investor from day one, we hit it off at the very start. There's so many wonderful memories of our time together, but I remember it was 2014, we had dinner at the Carlisle Hotel, and you told me about your plans for ARC. You pointed out that active managers were much in need of disruption. They were hugging the benchmark, and due to hidden marketing fees of 2.5%, it was impossible for them to even equal the indexes. Your vision was to create an actively managed ETF in the disruption and innovation space. It was brilliant and it was original. I suffered vicariously with you <laughs> along when you had those early years when you had to fund it with your personal capital. Every summer we get together at my home in the Adirondacks and there are a lot of memories there. It was the summer of 2014 and you came to talk to me about Amazon. The stock at the time was 300, and you said it was gonna go up to 1,000 because the AWS business was booming. Then again, the summer of 2017, I remember you came to talk to me about electric vehicles and Tesla, which was selling at the time at 45 on a split adjusted basis, and you said it was going up tenfold. And you mapped out exactly how fast the electrical vehicle rollout would occur, and you were spot on. One of your great strengths is how deeply you study the fundamentals and the innate confidence you have in your work. Anyone who wants to go up against you had better do their homework. <laughs> One of your competitive advantages is your background in economics. You graduated summa cum laude from USC with a degree in economics and finance. You were chief economist at Jenison Associates for 18 years. One of your earliest mentors was Arthur Laffer, one of the founders of Supply Side Economics. And I remember in the 2000s, you gave me an education. You said, you've got to study the national income account. That's where the real picture of corporate profits can be found. You are the world's greatest innovation investor in the public markets. But you're so much more than that. Despite your incredible track record, you've retained your humility and your perspective. You are deeply religious and your faith has carried you through grueling, difficult times. You lived for many years in Wilton, Connecticut, and you had that long, long commute to New York City. And you raised three children as a single mom and you never neglected them. They all turned out fantastically. And one of them now works at ARC. You're an inspiration to women all over the world. The super mom, the super investor, and a caring and compassionate human being. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh my goodness, Carol. Uh, well, yes, I remember those early years very well. Uh, I remember the first time I met, I had inherited accounts, which the uh, portfolio manager was retiring. He used to take your service, so I inherited your 13D research service, and I started reading it. But I didn't connect you to the service until we started talking that day. And immediately, we knew we were going to have a very long relationship, that we, we were both adventurers, and we both seek the truth, and we both dig deeply in order to find it. And we develop the courage of conviction out of that deep dive into uh, whatever we're studying. So I feel as though, yes, we are kindred spirits, Carol. Uh, this has certainly been an adventure. You showed me the way. I mean, your service certainly predated anything that that I I was doing. And, uh, and so it, it provided me with great strength to move forward, to know that someone thought this was a really good idea. Idea. And so, again, you were one of the big movers behind my decision. Uh, you know, not that we discussed it in depth that much, but all you needed to say is that is a great idea. Uh, so, thank you, Carol. 
Well, it was an honor to be there at the founding of what may be one of the great creations in the history of money management. And I'm so thrilled at your success. You deserve every single second of it. Thank you. If I can just say, Carol, if I could just say, I uh, I have the most incredible team around me. And I'll just hearken on one thing you said before. I feel that I was put on earth to do this, that I would, if I had retired at 57 instead of starting ARC, that I would not be a happy woman. I sort of feel like I'm a vessel for something that was meant to be. And yes, we all work so hard, uh, but the team that uh, I have around me is the best I've ever had. And you know what? Most of them did not come from the financial services industry. (laughs) I love that part of it. (laughs) Yes, you do have an incredible team. I've been down to your office. The energy there is just phenomenal. Well, let's start off with some questions. I've been a fan of women in money management for 30 years. Women are more intuitive than men, more flexible, $30 $30 trillion is going to be inherited in the next 30 years, most of it by women. And women want it managed differently than it has been in the past, more sustainable, more creatively. You've been managing money for 40 years, and obviously you had your challenges as a woman. But what lessons and advice can you give to aspiring women money managers? And what advice can you give them to help scale their business? Typically, a portfolio manager starts as an assistant portfolio manager. So I think the the most important piece of advice that I share generally to women and men is, you know, you want to bring fresh new ideas uh, uh, to your team and make your your team, but especially the lead portfolio manager, look brilliant. In other words, you want to be a team. You want to garner the trust of those around you, knowing that uh, you, uh, the person we're advising, have uh, their back. I think teamwork, collaboration, and a real sharing of ideas, especially ideas that are new, interesting, different, and, and differentiated. Uh, again, all with the all in the spirit of you know setting the team apart. So that's that's one piece of advice. And especially for the young members coming up, you are looking at the world in a different way, and the world is changing, as Carol said. So you really do have a lot to, of insights to offer. The other thing that I think is important, and and I. I I often say I've loved being a a woman in this business. I've had amazing mentors who have given me growth opportunities. And so if a person, a woman or a man, I'd say, delights their bosses or his or her boss, then uh, but does not get a shot at promotions, even though the numbers are speaking loudly, you have to move on. Just cut your losses and and bring your brilliance and your ideas to, to another team. And I guess the other thing is make sure that you do have numbers associated w- with you and your performance. Make sure you're as close to that as possible because numbers don't lie. Uh, uh, they will stick with you for better or for worse. And those are the risks you take. Uh, but this is the kind of position that it is. Well, that's usually insightful and wonderful advice. Thank you for that. By the age of 12, you you've moved 10 times. Your father, an Air Force design engineer, was moved from base to base. You are the classic military brat. <laughs> Did this constant need to start over new help you in being able to embrace innovation and to change, to let go of the old and to embrace the new? Yes, I think it helped a few ways. First of all, my father was a design engineer on radar systems, and that was the new world. This was the electronic age. This was the big new idea. And and he was... Um, he was right there with it and loved the world that he saw in front of him because of it. He, even when I was 11 years old, took me to UCLA so that I could learn how to punch cards for Fortran programming and so forth. <laughs> so, yes, I think the moves helped, but they helped in another way. 
they helped because I was able to go into a, a new environment as a very young person and size it up pretty quickly. Who do I trust? Who don't I trust? And one of the reasons I had to do this was uh, my parents are from Ireland. We lived in Ireland for a time and we lived in England for a time. Uh, and every summer we would go to Ireland. So I had a very thick, guttural Irish accent that I had to lose to when I got back to England. Because remember, England and Ireland at the time, especially, didn't like each other too much. And then when I came, left England with my pretty British accent, I had to lose it and transform back. I learned how to adapt to different circumstances, complicated situations, and size up who I could trust, who I couldn't trust. And I know that sounds crazy, a, a young child up until 12 years old, but I really do think it, it has helped me. It has helped me read people. Uh, it helps me, you know, figure out what is shall I say, BS from, you know, what is, uh, what is sincere communication. Uh, and I think that helps in sizing up management teams. Well, that's what they say is that the military brats are the best adjusted of all people. <laughs> but I hadn't known the story about the Irish broke. That's <laughs> uh, before we get into innovation, let's discuss your vision for the S&P 500. There's, you said that almost half of the S&P is threatened. The company is in those indexes are there because of the past 40 years. If disruptive innovation is going to be as pervasive as you think, many of these companies are going to be sidelines at best with consolidations, bankruptcies, restructurings. So traditional benchmarks may not be able to offer good returns. And the hardest hit would be those very companies the past decade that juiced earnings rather than investing in the future. In your own words, the other side of disruptive innovation is creative destruction. Can you please elaborate on this for us? Yes, well, I'll start by saying if you take the S&P 500, for example, and you look back to its earliest days, the average lifespan of a company back then was 100 years. Uh, today, we're down to 20, we're probably at fewer than 25 years. And we think given the kind of uh, creative destruction that is taking place and the innovation that's taking place, that that is going to drop towards 10, 10 years, perhaps below 10 years. Uh, so right there, you can see um, how much change has already happened. And yet we believe we are on the cusp of more change than has ever happened, right? So the five platforms, and I know we'll get into those in a bit, uh, but they involve 14 different technologies, all of which are entering uh, exponential growth trajectories and are going to disrupt an, uh, the traditional world order. So there's going to be tremendous disintermediation and disruption generally. Um, and so we see the energy sector uh, uh, in harm's way, financial se services certainly in harm's way, any uh, industry touching the internal combustion engine and its suppliers in harm's way, anything really physical uh, in harm's way to some extent in terms of being the touch point for the consumer, uh, the point of sale. So, uh, a, a lot has happened. We're seeing it. And just listening to uh, Jamie Dimon on the latest earnings report, uh, what we're hearing him say is, yes, we could be at the beginning of the hollowing out of financial services. We have to embrace this uh, and we have to do it quickly. Uh, it's, it's pretty shocking to see what's going on now in the financial services industry. And I don't think most of the players in the industry understand what is going to happen to them. What an amazing moment in time. Yes. Incredibly exciting. If you're positioned correctly, if you're not positioned correctly, it's going to be very, very painful. Absolutely. Stay on the right side of change. <laughs> exactly. The right, time of, right side of history. You've also said that research departments in the asset management business are going to have to restructure entirely to understand and integrate how innovation is evolving. 
Most of the traditional asset management firms are very siloed, very specialized, very short-term in their focus. And now we're seeing these innovation platforms that you study and invest in. They're cutting across all economic sectors. And that's not how these traditional asset management firms are set up. So how do you see this evolving and playing out? Yes, and I think it pertains especially to innovation, research and, uh, uh, and innovation. So the right way to set up uh, an organization that wants to capture or capitalize on innovation is to set up analyst responsibilities by technology. So the analyst would be a specialist on the technology, technology by technology, not just one or two technology analysts, but specialists. We have 10, uh, soon to be 12 technology specialists. And then they will be generalists when it comes to sectors. So it's flipping traditional research on its head almost. And the other thing that has to happen is collaboration because of the convergences between and among these technologies that we're seeing. So to give you an example of that, uh, Tesla. Tesla is a technology company, but it's not just one technology company. It's battery, so energy storage, robotics. Uh, so uh, uh, my Model 3 is a robot, especially when it goes autonomous, and, and, and it will sooner than I think most people think. It's uh, artificial intelligence, and it's software as a service. So we have three analysts building the Tesla model. And you can see our Tesla model on GitHub. Um, and the reason we put it up there is we feel there, because of the way traditional research is set up, auto analysts are following Tesla and they are not the right analysts to be following Tesla. So there's huge, huge inefficiency in the research uh, behind and the investment in Tesla. So much so uh, that um, we our target price right now is, uh, for our base case, is roughly $3,000. Uh, people think that's a crazy number. Uh, right now, the stock is closer to $700. We believe that the reason there's such a big inefficiency in Tesla's valuation is the short-term time horizon of analysts and the wrong analysts following it. Not their fault, probably their director of research his fault. That's an incredible insight. When we study disruption, which we've been following since 1995, the incumbents have such a hard time changing. Mm -hmm. Do you think the incumbent asset management industry is gonna be able to make this switch? I believe they're going to have to if they want to again, capitalize on this very important part of the market just to size it. In 2019, when we sized how, how much market cap in the public equity markets was focused on truly transformative uh, innovation, it was about 7 trillion. Uh, so really less than 10% of the global marketplace back then. It doubled last year to 14 trillion. And we believe that number is going to 75 uh, trillion plus during the next five to 10 years. And it probably will account, now consider the source, I'm talking my book, but we really do believe it will account for more than all of the appreciation in, uh, the, uh, in the equity markets because as you mentioned, the other side of disruptive innovation is creative destruction. So the traditional benchmarks today are being populated increasingly by value traps, cheap for a reason because they are going to be disrupted or destroyed. So I think it's going to be critically important to get innovation right. And I do not believe that traditional research departments are set up to do so right now. Well, that's usually hugely valuable. I can imagine that the shock in Wall Street as this starts to become understood. You've also said that this could be a great opportunity for active managers who, who get it. 80 to 90% of money is managed passively. It's, it's managed to these old companies that are going to go through huge discombobulation. 
And there are companies out there that are growing at exponential rates, while the traditional companies at best are growing 4%. You've also said that fixed income, part of the old 60-40, has really reached the end of its day with interest rates at 5,000 year lows. I don't know how much lower they can go. <laughs> so fixed income allocations are going to have to switch, and that means more allocations in, into equities. So how do you see all this, this playing out? I do believe we have a new asset class as well who that will move into a position uh, to take from uh, or to disrupt the 60-40. Uh, yes, I agree. More allocation towards equities uh, will, will be part of uh, the answer, especially as those in the fixed income markets begin to understand how uh, much in harm's way some of these corporate credits are. Now, this is ironic. We're at record tight spreads in the corporate market and the high yield market. And uh, I believe there is a storm brewing there and that we are going to see incredible gapping out of spreads as some of the innovation that we're talking about begins to hit EBITDA. If you look at the fixed income markets, you know, they look at EBITDA and they look at uh, three times coverage and that's about it. And it's all on trailing 12 months. And we've had uh, experience with this recently as we're tapping the, the, the debt markets ourselves. We can see how they're looking at the world and it's like, wow, is that backwards? And so uh, not until it hits EBITDA and, and is blamed for hitting EBITDA will uh, innovation begin to get into these corporate spreads, but it will. And so it's happening very slowly now. And as is, as is the case with innovation generally, it happens slowly, slowly, slowly until it happens quickly. And I believe we're moving into that moment within the next two to three years. I also believe that deflation uh, is, and, and what I mean by this is bad deflation associated with those corporations that leveraged up to buy back shares and pay dividends, uh, that that is going to enter the equation and be a wake up call as well. Uh, they weren't investing in a, enough in innovation, and they're probably going to lose their markets uh, more than any, more quickly than any analyst could possibly imagine. Uh, it'll be. I have always thought, really, I guess, starting with the tech and telecom bubble, that the bond markets, the fixed income investors, that were the very risk averse investors, and I would look to what the bond market was saying to direct some of my thoughts. I've stopped doing that uh, because I uh, I don't think they understand what's about to hit them. What is the Fed going to do if those? Um high yields blow out on the upside. Well, I, yes, I'm looking at uh, the Fed's behavior. At, I think they they see the possibility here that, that this could happen. They, they've been extremely dovish, I would say, just even as we were in a V-shaped recovery, they were not letting up on uh, this dovish talk. And one of the things that has happened is the coronavirus crisis has accelerated uh, some of these exponential growth trajectories by two, three, four years. And it may be that they are seeing that uh, and wondering with the, the, the highly leveraged balance sheets in uh, corporate America, what is going to happen? So uh, I think they're first and foremost thinking about sustaining the recovery and not being blamed for uh, derailing it. Uh, much like 2018, I think they understand they tightened too, too much and weren't paying attention to other signals. So I think they're being very cautious about this. We've gotten some big inflation numbers recently, and uh, I've watched the bond market. The 10-year Treasury bond yield peaked at 174 
at the end of March. Most people thought it was straight up and to the right to 3%, and the opposite has happened. Uh, even on the days of these big inflation reports, much higher than expected, 0.9 instead of 0.5 or 0.4, uh, the bond market rallies. What is that all about? I think the bond market is also saying, it is beginning to say, okay, if the Fed tightens too much because of these inflation uh, fears, uh, this corporate uh, debt could come tumbling down. So I do think it's starting to flag the, this warning. A and also, at the same time, you have a big shift uh, in from the consumption of goods, which are only one third of consumption, uh, that took place primarily during the coronavirus. In fact, it wasn't uh, the consumption of goods rose to forty-one percent over the over the year, uh, much higher than normal. And I think a shift now is taking place towards services, thanks to vaccinations. But I do believe that businesses started panicking and double, triple ordering. And now we're seeing the fallout with lumber prices being cut by more than half from 1711 to, I think today I saw 675 uh, and still falling. And we just heard one of our analysts today saying his parents had been driving by Lowe's and Home Depot regularly every day to see if there was any lumber uh, for, for months. And now the lumber's piling up uh, and uh, they're buying the lumber, but they can't get a builder. So we're still dealing with supply chain problems. But this means there's a cyclical deflation unfolding here which we'll get into the statistics later. And I think the Fed is looking at that and looking at the impact of these very high inflation rates on um, on purchasing power. So beginning to worry about, okay, how long will we have the consumer if this continues? So there are a lot of puts and takes, inflationary and deflationary here, that has the Fed on edge, I think. Do you think that the rally in the 10-year yield is a function of looking across the valley towards innovation? Or do you think it's a COVID-induced slowdown? I don't think it's COVID induced. I think one thing that happened was uh, in the first quarter, bond yields as measured by the 10 year treasury, uh, they doubled, they, they doubled. That was a record increase in interest rates. It was a very rapid. One of the reasons it happened is the banks had to disgorge treasury bonds because the Fed was uh, not going to be lenient anymore in terms of capital ratios. Uh, during the coronavirus, banks were able to have access to a little more yield because the Fed said, okay, you can count these treasury bonds towards your capital ratios. Now they can't. Uh, that ended at the end of March. I think many banks thought it would be extended because so many other forms of leniency were being extended. But uh, I think uh, politics got in the way. You had Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren saying, heck no, n these banks, we can't give them any more breaks. It's going to expire. So I think the banks had to disgorge all in one quarter those treasuries. So we're getting a little bit of the opposite of that. They've stopped selling bonds. Oh. That's part of it. I think part of it is the, 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 as I mentioned, some of the deflation, cyclical deflation we're beginning to see out there. And this concept of, oh my goodness, are we going to end up with a major inventory overhang in the good sector as the consumer shifts over to services? And that will, of course, cause deflation uh, in the future. Could be that. And then, then, I don't think the markets, or certainly not the fixed income markets, uh, or even the equity markets, are focused on how deflationary these innovations are. So um, as, as you know, we use something called Wright's Law, which is a relative of Moore's Law. And Wright's Law says for every cumulative doubling in the number of units produced, costs decline 
for technologically enabled innovation, costs decline at a consistent percentage rate. And this was in the earliest days of um, uh, aviation, Theodore Wright came up with, well, made this observation uh, looking at uh, the manufacture of airplanes, going from one to two, uh, two to four, four to eight. Every time there was that cumulative doubling, airplane, the cost to manufacture that airplane dropped by 10%. Uh, in the DNA sequencing market, which is the future of healthcare, that number is 40%. Uh, for short read and 28% for long read. In the battery packed system uh, uh, space, that number is 28%. In the industrial robot space, it's around 25%. These are major deflationary forces. Now we're at a very low base for all of them right now, but they are going to move the needle increasingly as we move forward. So we believe there's a major deflationary undertow out there. This is good deflation. It's associated with booming demand. And it will be an antidote to the bad deflation, which is associated with corporate distress.